Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is MPC Research Project 638, Analysis of ABC Bridge Column to Footing Joints. And today's presentation is brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with the four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes nine universities in Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Thanks to the MPC for providing the resources for the opportunity to research and deliver presentations like this. Our speaker today is Dr. Chris Panalides, and he has been the department, been with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Utah since 1991, where he is currently a professor and associate chair. He received his bachelor's in civil engineering from the American University of Beirut, Beirut excuse me, in 1980, and his master's from the University of Missouri Rolla in 1983 and his PhD also from the University of Missouri Rolla in 1987. And he was a design uh, structural engineer and a construction engineer before uh, getting into university work. So Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not the associate chair anymore. Oh, that's another story. But I've been here quite a while and it's my pleasure to make this presentation. Um, so, yeah, as the title says, um, analysis of accelerated bridge construction, bridge column to footing joints. And before I start, uh, I actually want to acknowledge uh, the work of two of my students, uh, Suma Neopani, who actually did uh, the analysis that I'm going to present today, and Ryan Barton, who actually, also another one of my students, who did the experiments. So, um, of course, when we talk here about analysis, we're implying the seismic analysis. And uh, as many of the uh, audience knows, um, this is very necessary for uh, bridges constructed in, in, in our region. So, um, I will uh, talk a little bit about what is this lecture about uh, after a brief introduction on accelerated bridge construction in seismic areas. I will uh, talk a little about the objectives of, of this work, the experimental overview, which uh, Ryan Barton was uh, the main student doing uh, that, and then the numerical modeling, which uh, Suma Nobhani did. And of course, then we try to compare the test that Ryan did, the experiments, with the numerical analysis. After that, in order to bring this work closer to reality, uh, we are presenting a parametric study that we did. Uh, we, we did this study on a, an existing bridge that was here until at least 2004 uh, on the old I-15 uh, freeway. And uh, that bridge, I, I was actually lucky enough to test it with the existing details at that time. But we modified the details to incorporate the work that we did here on accelerated construction. And we uh, adopted those dimensions of that bridge uh, to this work so we could analyze the bridge as if it was constructed with the details that I'm going to be presenting in this, in this presentation. Uh, subsequent to that, we did some nonlinear time history analysis of this bridge to demonstrate uh, the performance in, in a scenario uh, where we would have an earthquake here in, in Salt Lake City. And uh, using all the, actually, the, the options that we uh, came up with, that you will see in the presentation in the early part, as well as a cast-in-place uh, bridge comparison. So that will bring us to conclusions, and uh, that's how I'm going to close my presentation. So, accelerated bridge construction, of course, is a method where we have pre-constructional elements assembled at the site, which makes bridge construction safe and, and, and fast. Uh, it's preferable in areas, urban areas like here in Salt Lake City, because it can decrease the time of construction by 60 to 70 percent. The method we're using to join the columns and the footings and potentially the columns and the pile cap 
is grouted splice sleeves. And the combination of that with the grouted duct, as you will see. So um, these two are the main connection methods in any case. And in this particular work I'm going to show, we were able to actually combine them. So the grouted splice sleeve connects the reinforcing bars, which comes typically from the column inside the footing after casting them individually. And, and similar thing can happen for the connection of the column to the pile cap. Uh, of course, engineers and designers want to require the structural response of a bridge bend constructed this way to be comparable or perhaps even better than the seismic response of a casting place uh, joint or construction. So um, we want to study then the connection and its performance. And that is an essential part, of course, of saying, I'm going to build a bridge like that in a seismic region. So as an introduction, um, here you can see a grout splice lead connection with a factory dowel and a field dowel. And you can see how we actually constructed in the lab. We made a wooden template. And of course, what we want to do is make sure that this method um, performs similar to cast in place monolithic construction. So the bridge is safe to operate immediately after an earthquake. And of course the joint will be resilient. So after an earthquake, we don't have to close down the bridge. So this particular um, connection you see is the NMB splice sleeve, with, which is a cast iron sleeve filled with high strain grout. And the two bars come in. Typically the green bar that you see here is the factory dial from the column that goes inside the footing. Now, this connection splice leaves have been used uh, quite a bit actually uh, in many bridges and buildings. Here you can see the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas that uses these splice leaves. Uh, here in Utah in 2011, we used it for the Front Runner, which is a, uh, a train for the Utah Transit Authority. Uh, and you can see the bars that are sticking out and they look green as well <laughs> because they're coated, epoxy coated. And uh, very recently in Melbourne, uh, Australia, there is a very tall building, the 2020 Australia One Way, that uses these splice leaves. So the spl splice leaves are not very new and their use has been around for a long time. But in seismic areas, how does the bridge respond? That's, that's relatively new. So, um, as you can see, these grout splice leaves are effective. Uh, they limit damage for a small concentrated area around the column. They work effectively, but are not affected by the position. And then we have some bone slip during lateral loading. So the bone slip affects the performance of the joint. Here in this work, as you will see, not only um, we have the, to worry about the bone slip that's present, whether you have a precast connection or a casting place connection, but we also introduced an intentional debonding. And the intentional debonding is actually there to improve strain penetration inside the footing. And, and the reason for this is that um, we observed in the previous work by Amelie that uh, these, these, these joints using the grout splice leaves did not have the same ductility or deformation capacity as casting place joints. It was a little bit less. So our work here was mainly focused on the experimental side to try and improve that performance. But also the intentional debonding is something new. And we tried to see if we could model that incorporating the plastic hinge length that's there because of the small area of damage and the bottom slip, which is also there because when you're using bars in concrete, you're going to have on slip. So uh, as far as the numerical analysis, um, since in the experiments, we did a couple of half scale tests. Uh, these tests, I'm going to show you what they are uh, in the next slide. We had the bonding in the footing uh, and then the bonding in both the column and the footing. So in the numerical analysis, we tried to create a model that will represent this state of affairs. So we had actually two models. So the goal was to match the global and local response with a numerical model uh, based on the experiments that uh, Ryan had carried out. 
And then, of course, later, as I mentioned, we did a parametric study using an actual bridge uh, with the new details and, of course, with upgraded seismic details and compare it. So uh, the, the goal, of course, of any MPC project is to make some advancement and propose a numerical model so that designers and engineers can have a tool to use when they're designing these bridges for seismic zones. Uh, so we are comparing actually the numerical model um, and the experiment for both casting place and the two options of the uh, experiments that we did uh, for cyclic hysteretic behavior. After that, we, we use time history analysis. I will present it to you using the design basis earthquake and the maximum credible earthquake for both near field and far field earthquakes to compare the demand to the capacity in terms of drift, maximum drift, and also drift at the maximum lateral force. So here in the experimental overview, I'm showing the details of the two columns that were attested uh, by Ryan. And you can see these are octagonal columns, which are typical for precast construction. Uh, they are 21 inches by 21 inches. Uh, they have uh, six uh, bars, number eight bars, and they have number four spirals of two and a half inches. So the columns are very well confined. Um, so in the first test that you see on the left, test one, the intentional debonding was uh, eight bar diameters. Uh, inside the footing. So eight bar diameters here would be eight inches. So um, what, what you're not seeing though is that the bottom of the footing here it had to be extended by about four inches. So it was a little deeper footing to accommodate the sleeves. So below the red area, you can see below the debonding, you see the splice sleeves. So there is of course uh, six of them. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see test two which test two had uh, again eight inches of intentional debonding, but now the difference is that four of those inches are in the column and four of the inches are in the footing. So it's kind of like a, a split uh, debonding method there. And of course, below that, you see there is still some green bar which is bonded to the footing. So that's the main difference here between test one and test two. Uh, basically that in the footing, Test one has eight inches of debonding, and test two has four inches of debonding. However, in both of these, you see that the main idea is to resist splice leaves. And of course, when you do that, uh, you're going to have an area where there's nothing there. And as you'll see, what we did there, we introduced some uh, galvanized ducts. Okay. So the axial load on this column was about six percent of the capacity of the column for each case. So here is the detail of the column uh, on the left showing the cage, the steel cage. And on the right, you see the splice sleeve uh, with the grouted duct configuration. And where the grouted duct is, that uh, silvery looking duct, that's where the debonding was happening, okay? So this is what makes this a unique, uh, a unique construction method compared to the previous work we had done with Ameli. And of course, what you're seeing is that there is the, the wooden uh, template and at the bottom of that wooden template would be the top face of the footing. Uh, this can also be shown here in the drawings that you see for the footings. Uh, the footings are three by six foot and the height is two foot six inches. So those six inches were the extra thickness of the footing that was required so that we can accommodate recessing the splice leaves, which you can see there, uh, eight inches below the top surface of the footing. And then above those splice leaves, you see the grouted ducts shown a uh, dashed line uh, in the cross section AA. Cross section BB shows the other section, which uh, shows you there's quite a bit of rebar, both for flexure as well as for shear. And of course, the column was designed to, to be a protective element we didn't want the, the footing would be a protected element. We didn't want the footing to yield. So the footing is a protected element and all the yielding is supposed to happen in the plastic hinge of the column. Here is another picture that shows perhaps a little bit better the detail uh, at another cross section. 
and also a picture which shows the footing reinforcement cage and, and the six uh, uh, grouted ducts that lead to the splice slips below. Uh, in addition, you can see on the left, there is an additional spiral that was placed around the ducts. So we make sure that, this, that the ducts hold on to the splice slips so we don't have any movement during the casting operation. Uh, in the next picture, you do see uh, the grouting operation how the, the dry fitting of the extended bars, and you can see the method we use for debonding is basically a plastic PVC pipe with some duct tape. So that uh, prevents the grout and the bar uh, from, from connecting. And so that's how we do the intentional debonding. And of course, in the end, we do have to grout, and you can see the grout on the right image. So here's the uh, test setup. We, we are securing the footing uh, on the bottom floor, the strong floor, and you can see the column uh, with the axial load, which is applied using uh, these rods. Uh, there's one rod here and one on the other side. You can also see it here reacting against the beam at the top. So this hydraulic actuator applies the lateral displacement or lateral load, which is cyclic. And of course, the footing is, as I said, a protected element and it's fixed. Uh, here is the, the rod. It's fixed on the floor, as you can see in this image here. So we applied a, uh, <clears throat> a drift or a horizontal load at that level that you saw earlier, which is roughly eight feet. Um, and as I mentioned, we had the same length of debonding. Uh, by different distribution. In test one was eight inches in the footing, test two was four inches in the footing and four inches in the column. So this, uh, this load is applied very slowly, of course. It's a cyclic quasi-static load and the axial load is, is constant. At least we started at 6% of the, of the capacity of the column. The footing is fixed with the rigid base and we have strain gauges and linear variable displacement transducers to measure strain and rotation and, and curvature of this column. And, and typically what we do, of course, we plot the lateral force versus this imposed displacement to study the hysteretic behavior. So here you can see the experimental results uh, at different drift ratios. Uh, here is the one on the left at uh, 2%, and you can see we're starting to spoil the concrete and crash at the corners on the right. You can see the drift 6%, which really the spalling now starts to be very prominent. And uh, here you can see the, the final damage state on the left. And on the right, you can see a fractured bar. This is from test one. Test two is very similar. You can see spalling at 6%. At 7%, you can see evidence of damage and, and, and the plastic hinge. And then the final damage state is very similar to test two, and you can see we also have a, a fracture bar. So if we plot these results, um, on the left is test one as compared to a cast-in-place specimen that was tested by Amelie. And uh, you can see we reach a drift ratio of approximately 8% uh, on push and about 8% on pull, which is very large. And it comes very close, actually, to the cast-in-place condition, which was roughly, again, 8% before we start losing the load. On the right, you can see uh, test two. Test two uh, has very nice performance as well, but perhaps it fails a little bit earlier than the cast-in-place, but roughly about 8% again to 7% in the push direction. So both of these tests, perform very well, and I could say uh, their performance matches the cast-in-place condition, which is our original goal. So we, we prove with this that actually we can meet the original goal, which is not was not true for the um, specimens where the sleeves were flush with the top of the footing, which MJ Amelie had done. They were uh, acceptable performance in that case as well, but here, as you can see, the performance is uh, exactly the same as the casting place. So we're very happy with these results. Now, these results show that uh, we, we have uh, roughly the same uh, maximum lateral load uh, as the, as the casting place, 
at least in the same range, 37 to 36, 41 to 36. Um, the hysteretic energy, which actually is the area inside this hysteresis loop, again, it's equal or a little bit better, perhaps 30% better than the cast-in-place specimen. Um, and I would say the energy is comparable between the cast-in-place and test two. Uh, the fracture of the bar that I showed you happened at very large drift ratios, 11% which of course is, is, it exceeds any earthquake that would, these bridges would see uh, for test one. And for test two, it was 9% drift ratio, which, which actually is the drift ratio at which the casting place also had a fracture bar. Um, the displacement ductility, which is the ability of the bridge to go beyond uh, the yield point was about seven and a half percent. That's for test one, uh, 5.4 for test two, and for the casting place, it was 9.9. .9. So again, these ductilities are nothing to be ashamed of. They're very good ductilities, and they are approaching, uh, at, at least for case one, test one, that of the casting place specimen. And you can see the three graphs here on, the, on this figure plotted together. Uh, as far as a backbone curve for, for test one and, and test two, that's the triangle and the circle you can see that they, the triangle at least is, is reaching pretty far, even further than the casting place, which is the purple, the X. Uh, and, and test two is, is fairly close to the casting place. So that, that covers the experimental part. And now I'm going to get into the numerical modeling. Um, of course, experiments are very nice, and they give us very good input. And in this case, it was really uh, very very um, happy to see that we could match the casting place performance. At least to me, it was uh, satisfying to see that. But then, of course, it's expensive. And it's not very easy to do experiments like this every day in the laboratory. So modeling, numerical modeling, is one method that if we can make it come close to the experimental results, uh, designers and, and, and researchers can study various aspects that we couldn't study here, as I'm going to show later, the parametric study of a three-column bridge bend. Um, so this is something that we, we like to do, and uh, we, we, uh, we attempted to do this with my second student, Suma, um, how to create a numerical model that would represent accurately what happened in these three tests, the casting place, Test one with the eight inches of intentional debonding in the footing and the recessed splice leaves, and test two with four inches of debonding in the column, four inches in the footing, and again the recessed splice leaf. So for this, we use an open source code, which I know is not the code that people use every day in the design office. But again, this is not just for design. This is a numerical investigation of an experiment, and of course and nonlinear analysis, time history analysis, which is very advanced, that I realized probably would not be used for everyday work. Um, but in the future, these tools are becoming more and more available. Uh, for example, in the building world, we have ETABs, which comes very close to this analysis using OpenSeas. And eventually, I think these models will one day come into the design office. So in this uh, very nice research uh, funded by NSF, actually, software called OpenSys, Open Structure Earthquake Engineering Software. Anyone can get it. It's freely available. Uh, we use a material which is called Concrete 4, and Concrete 4 represents both the unconfined, which is shown here in gray. Uh, can you see my cursor, Thomas? Can you see my cursor at all? I can, yes, I can see it. Okay, so you can see this gray curve, it's the unconfined concrete, and the blue is the confined concrete. And of course here, number four at two and a half inches, we have a lot of confinement. And, and this is represented by a model uh, uh, that uh, Professor Mander presented in 1988 and is currently being used in this software. Um, so we use this uh, model to, to explain what happens to the column cover, which is the unconfined concrete, 
And what happens to the concrete inside the, the spiral, which is confined, of course. Uh, and uh, these particular materials we're using were, were kind of high strength. Uh, we got the concrete donated, so we couldn't uh, um, complain that they gave us free concrete when we did the test. Uh, and of course, uh, delaying the testing in the lab increases the strength. So it, at the t day we tested, the concrete compressive strength was rather high, 10.7 KSI. Okay, so um, the real innovation here in this model is how to model the reinforcing steel bars. This is a difficult exercise here because we have two effects. Um, as I mentioned, even in casting cast in place concrete columns, uh, the rebar eventually will start uh, slipping. So you have an effect which is called bond slip. But in addition to that, here in this particular two tests, as I mentioned, we we intentionally debonded uh, a length of eight bar diameters of the steel bars uh, to improve the, the ductility capacity of the columns, which worked. But then how do you model that? So we have two effects. We have the bond slip and we have the intentional debonding. So the material that was used in these models was the reinforcing steel material. And this material actually includes not only the traditional stress strain curve of the original bar that you see here in blue, but it actually includes uh, some more effects that are very, very important uh, in, in seismic uh, analysis, which is the fatigue. Uh, fatigue, of course, is the number of cycles uh, that you have at a certain strain, and we saw that because we applied roughly 22 cycles, and that's when the bars fractured. And, of course, buckling, because buckling was once the uh, cover concrete spalls and you start exposing the inside of the hoops, then you may get actually buckling of the reinforcing bar. And to some extent, we saw also some buckling. So uh, Haber did in 2013 develop a material model, which actually tries to imp uh, in, uh, impose in the in the numerical analysis this effect of bond slip. And you can see instead of the blue curve then. Uh, we might modify artificially uh, using, of course, experiments that Haber carried out, uh, these uh, modules of elasticity of the steel bars to make them a little bit uh, less uh, smaller modulus. And you can see that propagates all the way out to the end. So this, this uh, Haber did for the effects of bond slip. Uh, and here what we have added in the model is the effects of intentional debonding. Because if you don't do this and you don't modify the material property of the reinforcing steel bars inside the plastic hinge region, your model will not, <laughs> will not be compared well to the experiment. So the only reason we go to such length uh, is not to inflict pain on the designers, but actually to make sure that we understand the physical processes and we're modeling them correctly and we're modeling them in a repeatable way. So somebody in the future can come and say, okay, I haven't done this test, but if we're to do this test, I can be confident that using this model, I would get these results. So um, for the bone slip model, there was work done after Haber by Tazar and Saidi. And this work uh, models correctly the slip of the bone between the grout, which is inside the sleeves and the reinforcing bar. So in this case, we also had uh, grout in the sleeve, but also we had grout in the in the galvanized duct. So we had to model that as well. And, and in, in terms of what really happens for a certain bond stress, we actually have a certain embedment inside the sleeve, and that actually allows the slip through the grout. And from that, as I showed you in the last curve, the, the basic uh, idea is that for the same stress, you will have a higher strain in the bar, and that's the effect of bond slip. Uh, so here you can see some modified stress-strain relationships uh, for each condition. On the left, here you see for test one, uh, and on the right, you see for test two. 
So basically using these uh, equations that were proposed by Haber and Tazarv and Saidi, uh, we obtained the modulus of elasticity for a modified stress-strain curve of the steel bars that you can see here in red. Uh, and we call this the pseudo-modulus of the bar inside the plastic hinge length, whereas outside the plastic hinge length, uh, the stress-strain properties are assumed to be those of the original bar. So this little trick is necessary to get a good comparison to the experiment. And, and here you can see in the numerical model uh, all the numerical uh, parameters that we use. Uh, for example, for unconfined concrete, as I mentioned, is 10.7 strength. For confined concrete, if you use Munder's model with the uh, number four spiral, two and a half inches, you get 14.74. Uh, for the steel, we use 68 KSI for the yield. Of course, outside the plastic region, the model is 29,000 KSI, but inside the plastic region, we modified the modulus to get the uh, reduced modulus method that I mentioned. As far as low cycle fatigue, we use a, a model which is based on coffin manstons equation and Kunat's model, which is standard actually procedure inside open seas. And for the buckling model, we use a procedure proposed by Dakal and Maikawa uh, to consider uh, the buckling of, of, the, of the bars. Uh, so here is a cross section of the model layout. You can see at the top uh, section AA, that's a section outside, uh, inside the plastic hinge, I'm sorry, the red lines use the pseudo reinforcing bar that I defined with the reduced modulus and you can see inside the, the confined concrete and outside in gray, you can see the unconfined concrete, which is the cover. And on the bottom here with blue, you see the reinforcing bar outside the plastic hinge region. And these are the only two regions that are being considered in the column. Uh, and nothing for the footing, actually the footing is assumed fixed. And uh, you can see that these two sections are sufficient to describe uh, what is going on inside this octagonal column. The other thing you can see that this cross-section is not octagonal anymore, it's circular, but that's with equivalent area, so um, that is easier to model. So you see several radial subdivisions here and circumferential subdivisions that are necessary actually to, to have a good model. Um, we use a force beam column element, which is a standard element in open seas, which can incorporate this uh, plastic hinge length, as I mentioned. So the concept of the plastic hinge for a, for a casting place column is very well known. That's the damaged region. But for a precast column like this, if you're interested, you can go back to Amele's work, where we actually defined it very well as far as how to get that. So here's the numerical model. It is surprisingly simple. There is only two nodes. There is one node here at the bottom of the column on top of the footing. There is one node up here at the top. We're applying the axial load and the lateral load at the top node. Uh, what you're seeing here as green is the length of the plastic hinge. And we take that uh, from Amelie's work to be 12 inches for this particular column, which is 21 inch octagonal. Uh, that's the number that MJ came up with from his analysis and from observing observations in his test. He had done a quite, quite a few tests, he, I think eight tests, where we tested both casting plates and also precast columns. But in that case, the, the uh, splice leaf was either in the footing, at the very top of the footing, right here, or in the bottom of the column in this green area. So uh, based on that, we know there's going to be strain penetration in the debonding region uh, and, of course, down into the footing, both for test one and test two. So um, what we try to do then in this case, uh, we define the debonded length DL and the plastic hinge length LP. Now, from the experiments that Ryan did uh, here on the left and on the right, you can see for test one and test two, what kind of strains did we get? So we got pretty good strains actually in the debonded region, uh, roughly about one inch below the interface. This line here is the interface 
of the column to the footing. And we can see strains that are very high, up to 4%. Um, and for the test too, you can see that we got strains about, again, 3.8%. Of course, this kind of distribution, we have limited number of gauges, is, is the true performance. And on the left side, you can see what we are expecting, the ideal performance. Uh, ideal is never ideal. That's why it's called ideal. But at least we know we have very good uh, strain penetration and very high strain. So the debonding work worked. Here you can see again the difference between test one and test two. There is the eight inches in the footing, and there is the four inches in the footing and four inches in the column. So this worked well. Um, we, we calculated the plastic hinge for test one and test two, and we increased it because it was intentionally, of course, it would be larger than that of the casting place test that MJ did. So here you can see the magic. This is a comparison actually of all three tests, the casting plate that Amelie did, and you can see the open seas model, which actually he already had developed. And here you can see for test one and test two, which were tested here in this particular work, the X here indicates the bar fracture, and believe it or not, <laughs> I was amazed when the first time the student showed this to me, uh, the model, the open seas model, predicts bar fracture in the same cycle as the experiment. This is true for all three tests. This is amazing. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, it's not perfect. The model doesn't pick up all the peaks and valleys, but at least it does a fairly good job of pe pe keep, keeping together the uh, loading and uh, loading stiffness both for the casting place and the two precast specimens. So here you can see the area inside the hysteresis loop. Uh, we call that the hysteretic energy. It's the, pretty much the capacity of, of the specimen. And you can see from this graph that uh, the agreement between the open seas model and the experiment is very well. And you can see that um, the, the, these specimens dissipated substantial energy. So I would say that uh, on the global level, the response of the experiment to the model is good, and the model is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, even on the local uh, level, I would say the bar fracture, which happened at 11 and 9 percent, was picked up by the model. And the strain and the failure patterns suggest good agreement uh, with the experiments. So at that point, I felt like we're ready now to go to big time. So let's just apply this model and see what can it do for a three-column bridge bend like this one. So uh, as I mentioned, I was fortunate to test this uh, bridge bend on, on uh, South Temple Bridge on I-15 before the bridge was demolished for the um, upgrade of the I-15 for the Winter Olympics. Uh, this is a full-scale bridge. Uh, the columns were three feet square, 24 feet high. Copying three by four feet, 65 feet long, the footings and with piles and pile caps and great beams. Of course, what this actual bridge was, though, uh, we, we had tested it uh, on the cyclic loads, and we knew the performance of this bridge. Unfortunately, this bridge was cast in place, and it had old details, not current seismic code or current ASTO code even. So we, we took the dimensions, but we modified everything. We kept the footings and, and the pile caps and everything and the grade beams, as well as the cap beam elastic. And so we imposed elasticity at the top and bottom of, of, bottom of these columns. And so we modified the details so they would actually be compatible with what I presented to you for both casting plates, current seismic code, and test one and test two details. In addition, as my geotechnical friends tell me, there is no fixed bridge in life. So we had to actually model the soil structure interaction uh, by using some frictional springs uh, soil. And that was also uh, done by a former student, uh, Dr. Wu. So the numerical model then um, includes the great beam, includes the frictional springs, uh, which model the piles and their effects. And we have nodal masses that are applied at the nodes on the deck, as well as on the bottom of the columns. Uh, we have, again, 6% axial load in the three columns. And we have concrete four material using Mander's model for the concrete. 
and reinforcing steel for the rebar. Very similar to what we did for the two test models. And you can see here the layout of the bridge is surprisingly simple. There's only six main nodes, as you can see, two for each column. Uh, and we are assuming, of course, that the top part here uh, for the for the cab beam is, is, is rigid because we designed it as, as such. And you can see we, we kept the dimensions uh, as, as, as three foot square, which was the original bridge, but we actually modified it so that it complies with the new current seismic code. Um, so we, we kept the reinforcing ratio the same, 16 number 10 bars, and we provide enough confinement so that these columns meet the current code. So here, as we did also for the model of the two test specimens, we divided the cross section into core and covered concrete, uh, and we use force beam column elements for the column. We use elastic elements for the grade beam and the cap beam, and we use the rigid link uh, for actually at the interface that you can see here. So the the cap beam is rigidly connected to the to the columns. Uh, down on the bottom, we use uh, frictional springs for the pile cap and the, and the piles, as I mentioned. And we know this model worked because we had used it before uh, to study the original uh, test that I did back in 2000. So the cross-section was modified to, to put in the uh, comparisons for the different uh, three different versions of this. Um, the length of the plastic hinge, uh, we restricted the bar pullout. We estimated about 12% of the uh, height of the, of, the, of the column for the cast-in-place case. And for type 1 and type 2, we calculated as for the experiments. Um, so, so the intention of debonding, I guess, again, we assume eight times the diameter of the bars, which was a number 10 bar. So here is some details. These are all fictitious, of course, of what the uh, type 1 and type 2 column to cap beam connection would, would, uh, would entail. As you can see, the type 1 is all inside there, the cap beam and the footing, whereas for type 2, we, we strictly follow the same idea. We use uh, half of it is inside the footing and half of it is inside uh, the, the cap beam or the column. So it's, it's the 8 bar diameter here is 10 inches, so it's 5 inches in the cap beam, 5 inches in the column and the same thing in the footing. So we're following the, the same idea, uh, and we are considering both the bond slip and the intentional debonding effects, uh, which were used before to validate the experimental models and using these pseudo-material properties. So the compressive strength, we use exactly what was measured at the bridge, 4.9 KSI, and yield strength, 48.7 KSI, and ultimate 73. So here is the model comparison to the test that I did, actually. It shows the envelope of, with, of the cyclic test that we did. Uh, and you can see the experiment is black. Uh, the effect of the soil is, is not very significant, although it's there. It's red uh, with the soil, and if we assume fixed, it's green. So this is actually the displacement we imposed on the capping in the early experiments back in 2000. And this was roughly the lateral force we had to push the cap in about 500 kips to get to 8 inches. I was not brave enough to push that bridge more than 8 inches. But at least it shows that the model works for that situation. And now going forward, I'm showing here what I'm trying to compare. For the three cases of casting place, test 1 and test 2 details, I'm trying to compare what is the maximum drift I can get, delta u. And also, what is the drift at the maximum peak lateral force? And that will be delta P. So th these are the two parameters that I'm going to be talking about from here on out. So once we were sure that the model worked, at least for what we had tested in, on the side, we started saying, let's apply these three different casting plays, test one and test two. And we use the design spectrum suggested by the U.S. Geological Service for soil exceeding with site class D. Uh, so the probability of exceedance here is 10% in 50 years is the design basis earthquake, and 2% in 50 years 
is the maximum credible earthquake. Period of this bridge was 0.43 seconds. So we used 14 near field and 22 far field earthquakes spectrally match with this site specific spectra, response spectra. We use a software called SeismoMatch and we further scale the ground motions to match the Salt Lake area. So here you can see the spectra. Uh, for the target spectrum is the red for the design basis earthquake and the blue one is for the uh, maximum credible earthquake. These are unmatched uh, for far field. And from the right, you see the unmatched spectra for near field earthquake. And then here is where we did the matching, the spectrum matching, uh, both for far field earthquakes. This is the design basis. And this is on the right, you see for near field earthquakes. So here is a couple of plots of actual Chi Chi Taiwan earthquake. Uh, and we don't have very good data here in Salt Lake City, so we use this large earthquake. And you can see the casting place is the black curve. The red curve is the um, detail one for the precast uh, test one type. And the green one was for the test two. Uh, you can definitely see that we get similar performance. Uh, this is the movement of the pile cap, uh, of the cap beam, I'm sorry. And you can see that the red one, which is the type one, actually has a little more displacement, which means it allows it to move a little bit more, which is what we observed also in, in the test. Uh, and the same thing here for near field earthquakes, but definitely a very similar performance. Uh, here it shows the lateral load versus displacement hysteresis. Again, for all three types, cast in place, type one and type two. Uh, and then this is far field, near field, very, very similar type of behavior. Uh, this, these graphs here show the demand to capacity ratio uh, for the maximum drift um, for the bridge bend with the new seismic details, the three column bridge bend. You can see in black the cast in place demand to capacity ratio. Of course, it's less than one, which means the bridge will survive for far field earthquakes. And uh, this is for design basis earthquake. The one on the right is for um, maximum credible earthquake, and we get up to 60%, which is still safe. But you can see that the precast elements actually are doing, the precast details are doing slightly better than the cast in place, although in the same range. And uh, this is the demand to capacity ratio for the maximum drift. Uh, and this is for near field earthquakes. And you can see again, very similar performance uh, for both design basis and, and maximum credible earthquake values. So um, based on what I showed you, I think I may be able to convince you that the experiment showed that intentional debonding is a good thing inside the footings. Uh, it's favorable compared to the monolithic type bridge bands. Uh, I think the analysis we did for the parametric study, as well as the models, show that this force based beam column element, which incorporates the plastic hinge, uh, predicts the behavior well when we use these ground splice slips. Uh, we were able to model the effect of the bond slip as well as the intentional debonding uh, using equations presented in this paper and modified material properties of the reaper inside the plastic hinge region. Uh, the model seems to be effective for modeling these precast reinforced concrete members uh, and the modified reinforcing models of elasticity was able to predict the response in good agreement. Uh, so the numerical model for test one and test two predicted the 11% and 9% drift ratio, uh, respectively, before failure. Of course, the models were developed after the experiment, so they were kind of tuned, but still they were able to predict very well. Um, the, the capacity in drift is very impressive. Uh, it's, uh, it meets the code by far and indicates that a reinforcing bar with intentional debonding can be used in seismic regions. Uh, the, the hysteretic energy of the models was very close within 6% of test one and test two, and this is very satisfactory. 
And the bar fracture at those drift ratios was predicted well with the experimental evidence. So the parametric study uh, for a full-scale three-column bridge pen showed that we are able to at least predict the performance of the full-scale test that we did accurately. And using this model and modifying the column properties, uh, we predicted demand to capacity ratios in terms of maximum drift and drift at maximum lateral load for both design basis and maximum credible earthquake levels. This suggests that these precast bridge pens would perform as well or maybe even better than the casting plate bridge bands. So there is no barrier in using these types of techniques to, to build bridges in seismic regions. So I want to thank the Mountain Plains Consortium under contract 638, NMB Spliceleaf of North America, who helped with experimental uh, cost, and for Terra Structural Precast, who, who are our partners actually here in the valley and they help us with constructing the specimens. This is done at the real precast yard. So it's as close to reality as you can get it. Uh, the arrangement we have, my, my students build the rebar cages. We take them to Forterra and they cast them for us. So we, we have a very good control actually of what will happen in the field. So these are some of the references that I used in this presentation. Um, many of those uh, that I mentioned in the in the in the uh, presentation and I want to thank you for your attention and stay till the end and if you have questions I will take them I either did very well or I put everybody to sleep <laughs> so everyone is is stunned by the information that you presented so um, thanks everyone for participating in today's TLN event we appreciate your time and participation and attention uh, we sincerely hope you enjoyed and gained some new knowledge from today's session. I encourage you to visit the uh, Transportation Learning Network website at www.translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access our learning management system. If you see a topic that's interesting, please share it with your peers and invite them to, to sit in. Have a fantastic week. Be safe and don't forget to be awesome. And one last call for any questions. Yes, I have a question. Oh, awesome. Uh, this is Kelly Banks, and uh, I work with Tom at NDSU. Um, one question I have is, you discussed the epoxy-coated rebar. Do you have any information on uh, stainless steel or galvanized coated rebar? So, um Unfortunately, in this research program, we only use um, actually black steel. We even we didn't even use coated rebar because it wasn't in the scope of our corrosion was not in the scope of our work. We have done some work with uh, stainless steel, uh, but not in a seismic setting. We we, ju we just did some tests uh, for axial loading, but those uh, were actually corroded before we tested the column. So if you're interested please send me an email and I will forward that information to you. Okay, thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Great question. Any others? All right. Well, it seems All like right. I can go for my walk now. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We appreciate your time and, and uh, you. your presentation. Thank you. All right.